we are seeing and experiencing something we haven't experienced, at least in many of the developed economies, for a long time. Inflation, significant inflation. And we're using a phrase or a word that we haven't used also for a long time, stagflation. So, Nuru Rubini, you're not always known for your optimism about the global economy, but listening to an interview you gave this morning, you seem not just long-term gloomy, but short-term gloomy. You think we're headed inevitably for a recession. So I guess my first question to you is, is a hard landing now inevitable? And if so, when did we go past the point of no return? When did you think, oh, this isn't going to end well? Um, <clears throat> well, people like myself who were old enough remember the 1970s when you had two major oil shocks the war in 73 between Israel and Arab states, and then in 79, the Islamic revolution in Iran that led to oil embargoes, spiking oil prices, high inflation, and recession. And I think, unfortunately, this time around, we have uh, both demand factors and supply factors that are causing stagflation and high inflation. On the demand side, of course, we had loose monetary and fiscal policies during COVID with excess savings that now are leading to pent up demand, but there were a series of negative supply shocks. Uh, first, the impact of COVID, lockdown, reduction of supply of labor, global supply chain problems. But this year we had also two other negative supply shocks, the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, rising energy prices, food, fertilizers, and industrial metals. And now the zero COVID policy of China's leading to slowdown of growth of China and further bottlenecks on the global supply. So we have a situation similar to the 70s, excessive aggregate demand and negative supply shocks. Now, central banks hope that they can raise rates just enough to slow down the economy to bring back inflation to 2%. But the history of the last 40 years suggests that whenever, at least in the US, inflation is above 5%, and right now it's 8.5%, and when unemployment is below 5%, right now it's 3.5%, any attempt by the Fed to essentially raise rates to fight inflation causes a hard landing rather than a soft landing. That's why my baseline scenario right now is of a hard landing for the US, for the Eurozone, for the UK, and most advanced economies. Well, I was going to ask you quickly about that. So as far as you're concerned, the recession that we would see in the US will inevitably be followed by or come with a recession elsewhere? Well, it's going to be followed by a recession elsewhere for two series of reasons. First of all, when the US sneezes, the rest of the world gets a cold. The US is large enough that what happens economically and also in terms of financial markets in the US that affects the global economy. Two, the same factors that are leading to recession in the US are occurring also in the Eurozone, Europe, and the United Kingdom. If anything, actually, I would say Europe is more exposed to Russia in terms of energy. Europe is more exposed to the slowdown of China given trade with China, the euro is falling in value, and that's inflationary. And the recovery of Europe was more dynamic than the United States. So in some sense, Europe, Eurozone, and UK are as fragile, if not more fragile, than the United States. Well, we'll come back to some of this. But Your Excellency, I guess I should ask you, does the vision of the global economy that Nuru Rabini has just laid out, does that, uh, is that consistent with what you're seeing? And what's the impact, particularly in Qatar? Uh, thanks for having me. Um, in fact, uh, the global economy is facing a perfect storm uh, of rising uh, food uh, and energy prices along with an increase in uh, interest rate. The impact of this uh, storm might vary from country to, to other. Uh, those countries with high income, self-sufficient production of commodities, in my view, uh, will be uh, more prepared to withstand uh, this uh, storm. On the other hand, those uh, countries with low income and import most of their uh, food and uh, energy uh, might face a very difficult time and a high inflationary pressure. Uh, central banks uh, started to reduce the demand. Uh, However, if uh, 
the supply side remain uncertain, then uh, the, the central bank's action might be uh, limited. Um, in my view, um, uh, this year we might face a stagflation and we might be in recession by uh, 2023. And you, you have a peg with a dollar, which means you have to follow the Federal Reserve quite closely. Uh, you raised interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point recently. Um, do you expect in the future, just as a matter of expectation, that you will follow exactly what the Fed does, or do you have some room to, to move around? Yeah. Um, Stephanie, we have a very effective uh, monetary and exchange rate uh, policy. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, increased the interest rate twice this year in total of 125%. We have an uh, inflation of 5.18% in, in Qatar. Um, uh, the effectiveness of uh, uh, our monetary and exchange rate policy uh, is benefiting us. We have experienced and witnessed uh, an inflow of capital uh, recently. This approved our, effect, our monetary and exchange rate uh, policy. Um, we, are, uh, we, uh, we act to contain the inflation in, in the state of Qatar. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, we are ali uh, aligned with the uh, U.S. Uh, as well. So we expect that to increase the interest rate to contain the inflation. And you don't sometimes wonder, I mean, the Fed has now had a lot of criticism. By any stretch, it kind of failed in its one job, which was controlling inflation. Do you, did you, do you sometimes regret that you've contracted out so much of your monetary policy to the Fed? Now it's screwed up. Um, actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we heard some criticism on the Fed, but uh, we, if we go back uh, to the time, uh, at that time, um, when the Fed took the decision not to increase the interest rate, um, the world, the world uh, situation were different. There was no uh, war in Ukraine, and most of the economies, uh, economic, economies just reopened again. So, um, so the situation is different now. We have different situation. We have uh, war in Ukraine. We have uh, the uh, supply chain disruption and uh, uh, China's uh, zero COVID policy uh, in a place, still in a place. So um, it, it's, it's very difficult for policymakers to take decision. They take decision in, uh, based on data that they have. So, uh, but uh, circumstances could change in the future that you don't expect to, uh, to happen. Uh, this is my, uh, my view to it. I mean, Nouriel, how different is the US problem to the rest of the world? I mean, we don't want to go back um, sort of beating up on the Fed uh, for the sake of it. I think it's more about what should central banks do now. And we have some understanding about what the Fed's going to do. But would you say that... Europe potentially has more or less room in terms of the central bank response? I mean, they don't face the same kind of demand issue that mm. the U.S. faces. Or is really the, fundamentally the problems quite similar now in Europe? Well, in terms of um, levels of inflation rates, uh, the levels in the Eurozone right now are as high as the United States. Uh, uh, in the U.K., it's even worse than that. Among advanced economies, the only one that has uh, much lower inflation is still Japan. That explains why the BOJ policy is uh, very different. And it's true that the nature of inflation in Europe might be slightly different. More exposure to energy in Russia, uh, more of headline inflation rather than core because of that, slightly less strong wage uh, dynamics, uh, more supply shocks rather than aggregate demand shocks. But in a world where you have uh, this stagflationary shock, whether you're the Fed, the ECB, the BOA, SMB, RBA, or you name it, you're in trouble because whenever you have these stagflationary shocks, inflation is higher, growth is lower. If you care about inflation and not the anchoring inflation expectation, you have to exit and normalize sooner and faster, but that increases the risk of a hard landing. And if instead you care also about economic growth, and you normalize more slowly, 
then the risk is that you're going to have a de-anchoring of inflation expectation. And whether the shock is supply or demand, in some sense, doesn't matter. Even in the presence of a supply shock, like we learned from the 70s, if you don't fight inflation, inflation expectation can get de-anchored, and you end up with stagflation, not just with inflation, but also recession. And I would say uh, the ECB is as much in a pickle as the Fed, given the exposure to Russia, given the exposure to China, given the more dynamic recovery, given that the euro is falling in value, and therefore you're going to have more important inflation. So the problems are similar. And when you think about the sort of global knock-on effects of this, or we would call it the spillovers, <laughs> I mean, we had years after the global financial crisis where we talked about currency wars, and the game in currency wars to de was to depreciate your currency and try and import some inflation because inflation was too low. What's the risk now, or how much are we already seeing the reverse of that, the stronger U the, the U.S. in effect trying to export inflation through a stronger dollar? Yeah, a stronger dollar implies that inflation is higher in Europe, is inflation is higher in other advanced economies, but more importantly, inflation is also much higher in emerging markets. We've spoken about advanced economies, but in some sense, the situation of emerging markets is more difficult. Of course, you have to make a caveat. There are some emerging markets that are energy and or commodity exporters. Those are doing well, like in the region. Uh, there are some emerging markets that have stronger macroeconomic fundamentals with lower inflation. But, you know, the typical EM that is net commodity importer now is facing raising rates in the United States with weakening of their currencies that leads to higher inflation and with higher borrowing costs. Uh, it has a terms of trade shock because, especially in Asia, but also in many other emerging markets, they are net commodity importers. And for them, the rise in energy food, fertilizer, and that's a metal, is a major economic shock. Of course, if you are in very poor countries, you get to the point in which they have to worry about hunger, if not famines, like in sub-Saharan Africa. And the third shock for emerging market is this slowdown of China that is now significantly also affecting negatively, especially economic growth in Asia that is connected to the global supply chains of, of China. So you got the Fed shock, you get the dollar shock, you get the terms of trade shock, you get the China shock. So that's why uh, folks at the World Bank and IMF say uh, for many emerging markets or poor countries, this is not a, a COVID recession, it's a near depression that they have to worry about. And Your Excellency, I mean, if we see big currency moves coming out of this, and particularly the dollar strengthening or big swings in the dollar, could you anticipate, I know you would never talk about changes in exchange rate regimes in the short term, but can you anticipate me wanting to move to maybe a more flexible peg or a slightly more flexible system? As I mentioned before, um, our monitoring and exchange uh, rate policy is working very effectively for, for uh, our economy. Um, also, the um, IMF uh, recently in their reports uh, highlighted that uh, the picked exchange rate to US dollar for GCC is uh, uh, is remain uh, proper, so um, we don't see any changes to our uh, exchange rate uh, policy. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we we are uh, witnessing an inflow of capital to uh, to our to Qatar stock exchange market. This is uh, this is an approval of uh, the effectiveness of uh, our uh, uh, policy. So the, we don't see any changes in... in uh, and are you confident, you mentioned the inflation rate, it's one of the highest inflation rates in the Gulf. Are you confident that you have the tools to bring down inflation when you have other factors potentially pushing it up, like the World Cup, for example? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Stephanie. Um, we have uh, a different economic situation in Qatar. We, we've been investing in our infrastructure uh, since the last 10 years to, uh, for the preparation for uh, the World Cup. Uh, and uh, as well as that, we have an economic activities uh, different than uh, the rest of the uh, GCC countries. Um, we are going to host a major event this year. And this event will uh, boost the activities, uh, economic activities in the state of Qatar. So uh, it is normal that we have uh, uh, a little bit higher uh, interest rate, but our our uh, aim here to uh, to contain the the inflation.
uh, in the state of Qatar, and we have the tools to, uh, to do so. I had a, an, another question for you, and it, it, it came up in the earlier discussion today. Um, there was much debate after the seizing of the Russian foreign exchange reserves unexpectedly in response to the Russian invasion. Uh, that central banks around the world would be thinking about how their reserves were allocated and perhaps not wanting to have so much dollar exposure. Is that, is that a conversation that you've had in the, in the central bank? Actually, we have a diversified portfolio in the central bank. We have uh, uh, m uh, different uh, uh, major currencies in our portfolio. So uh, uh, we are well di diversified, and this is our strategy always, to diversify and not to depend on, on, on one currency in uh, our uh, portfolio. So uh, we will continue to do so. You didn't see any change, potential to need to change in the unexpected sanctions on the reserves, the Russian reserves? Um, actually, um, uh, our diversification is in Europe and the US and Far East, so it's a very well diversified portfolio before all of these uh, incidents happening. So uh, we are not worried and we are very confident of our portfolio. Now, Nuria, we're going to run out of time, but you have spoken quite a lot about crypto in the past, and I was interested, given it's been a pretty turbulent ride for a lot of the cryptocurrencies in the last few months. How, how are you looking at the, is it the future? Was it a fad or is it the future or are you changing your view? Uh, well, from the peak of last November, Bitcoin has lost about 70% of its value. Other cryptocurrencies have lost 80 to 90% of them. You know, the study suggested 90% uh, of all ICOs were scams of one sort or another. I think, however, the most important point is that Calling cryptocurrencies currencies is a misnomer. Anybody who knows about uh, monetary theory and policy, like His Excellency, uh, knows that for something to be a money or a currency has to be unit of account. Nothing is a price in Bitcoin. It has to be a scalable um, a means of payment. With Bitcoin, you can do seven transactions per second. With the Visa network, you can make 50,000. It has to be a stable store of value. Here you have an asset that can go up and down in value overnight by 10, 20%. Not even crypto conferences accept Bitcoin as a means of payment <laughs> or a store of value. And as to be a single numerator, so you can price the relative price of goods and services. If every good and service is a different token, it's like going back to barter. You cannot even see the relative price. So calling them currencies is really a misnomer. But is it the, is it the death of that? misunderstanding if it was a misunderstanding what's happened in the last few months of people will people come to their senses do you think well there was a huge bubble there was a fear of missing out uh, there were ponzi schemes many people have bought at their peak and now they've lost uh, a fortune whether in cryptocurrency crypto assets DeFi, and so on i think that in this space if you want stuff that is going to be not vaporware you need to find uh, asset back uh, tokens of one sort or another that are backed by real assets or financial assets. Otherwise, those that are based on essentially vaporware are going to be disappearing over time. Excellency, mm. are you as damning of crypto? Is that the official, is the official line that cryptocurrencies are not currencies? Um, crypto assets, um, is, uh, crypto assets are uh, technology innovation, and in my view, uh, it might take us to a new era of uh, fast, cheap, and uh, more accessible uh, uh, to payments and financial uh, services. However, uh, those uh, crypto assets, which is not, uh, uh, not uh, uh, underlying by an asset uh, or monetary authority, might be uh, less credible. Uh, many central banks now are discovering to issue their CBDC, and we are not an exception of that, uh, uh, but we are still uh, in a uh, foundation stage. Uh, we are uh, evaluating the pros and cons of uh, issuing the CBDC and to, uh, to find uh, the proper and uh, uh, the right uh, technology and the platform to issue our uh, CBDC. I, I hesitate to ask this final question to you, Nuriel, but I was looking at my notes, and the last time we spoke, which was 
more or less in the middle of COVID, you uh, were predicting that there would be uh, some inflation coming out of COVID um, that would cause policy mistakes and you would then have a 10-year depression in most of the world economy, give or take. Are we more or less on course for that or can we expect something slightly better? Mm -hmm. um, I certainly worry about stagflation in the short run, uh, but I think that uh, the factors that might lead to mediocre growth are not just short term. If you look at medium term, there are a whole series of other negative supply shocks. We have deglobalization and protectionism. We have reshoring of manufacturing from low cost to high cost. You have aging of populations. You have uh, restriction to migration. You have this decoupling between US and China. You have global climate change in many channels is stagflation and reducing growth and increasing cost of production. You have, unfortunately, recurrent pandemics. You have cyber warfare. You have a backlash against income and wealth inequality. You have the weaponization of the US dollar. These are all factors that are not short term, that over time may reduce growth, increase cost of production, and being stagflationary. So unless we address this issue, we could end up not with a mild recession, but something more like a depression with inflation, meaning a deeper stagflationary debt crisis, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Doom and His Excellency, thank you very much. You're welcome.